Thank you very much, Father Dragos. Uh, um, it's a huge pleasure to be speaking about um, Tarkovsky, Faith and Tarkovsky this evening, um, and to be able to listen to Christoph talk about Solaris in a minute. Uh, I'm going to share uh, this, if I can, with you all, and then we will begin. I hope everyone can see uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So thank you, Father Dragos, thank you, Razvan, and thank you, Christoph, for inviting me to speak uh, this evening. This is uh, a, a short paper called Faith and Folly in Tarkovsky's Stalker. Dogged by problems from the start, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's masterpiece was almost never made. Shooting was scheduled to begin at Isfara in Tajikistan, in April 1977, but these plans had to be abandoned when the area was hit by a violent earthquake. Having relocated to Tallinn in Estonia, filming could finally commence. But after three months work, Tarkovsky found the rushes were poor and the condition of the film stock degraded. Furious, he blamed uh, uh, the suppliers of the film stock, he blamed his cameraman for failing to check the quality of the film, and he blamed the technicians at his production company, Mosfilm, for using the wrong development procedures. Tarkovsky describes the situation in his diary as a total disaster. But in disaster, Tarkovsky found the motivation to carry on. In disaster, he found redemption. I quote again from his diary. The disaster is so conclusive that one actually has the sense of a fresh stage, a new step to be taken, and that gives one hope. End quote. This hopeful stepping, as he calls it, out of disaster, gives us a hint as to the character, the determination, and the vision of Tarkovsky the artist but it also finds full and moving expression in the film he goes on to make, Stalker. Stalker is shaped and characterized by this movement, a hopeful sense of being impelled towards something better, something elusive yet tangible, something that draws us towards the margins, but which is also at the heart of ourselves. In short, faith. Tarkovsky's fifth film, Stalker, has the timeless unsettling atmosphere of a dream, the disjointed and compressed tumbling out of a Dostoevsky novel, the crystalline quality of a fairy story or Russian folk tale. And like all fairy tales, Stalker is ultimately about transformation, or the possibility of transformation. It's this possibility that is opened by faith. Faith, if you like, is the mode or the key in which Stalker is conceived and written. Overlaying these deep themes of transformation and faith are experiences familiar, familiar to everyone. Love and divided loyalty, hope and despair, running risks and facing failure. So with that claim that faith is the key to the film, let's look at Stalker itself. The Stalker is the protagonist. A Stalker in the film is an illegal guide, almost a trafficker, if you like, someone who leads. He leaves his wife and disabled daughter in order to lead two men, the writer and the professor, on a dangerous, illicit journey to find a fabled room in which their deepest dire desires will be fulfilled, or so the stalker claims. This room line is hidden at the heart of an area of land, the zone that has been cordoned off, believed perhaps to have been visited by aliens. 
The human population has been evacuated and the military now patrol the perimeter. There are reports of strange happenings, supernatural phenomena inside the zone. And at the very beginning of the film, we're presented with an ominous report from a fictitious Professor Wallace, a Nobel laureate, who describes how the zone came into existence. I quote from uh, the, the card at the beginning of the film with these words on it. Was it a meteorite? A visit of inhabitants from the cosmic abyss? One way or another, our small country has seen the birth of a miracle, the zone. We immediately sent troops there. They haven't come back. Then we surrounded the zone with police cordons. Perhaps that was the right thing to do, but I don't know. End quote. We first meet the stalker, his wife and daughter, sleeping in a bed together in their apartment by a busy, uh, noisy railway line. Having crept out of bed and quietly dressed, the stalker is confronted by his wife, who begs him to stay, not to leave her alone again, not to risk everything they have in order to venture back into the zone. But he refuses to listen, leaves the flat, and meets the writer and the professor as they've arranged at a bar. They embark on their mission, approaching the fortified perimeter of the zone in a jeep, the watchtowers, barbed wire, barriers and searchlights that mark the entry to the zone would immediately have reminded a contemporary audience in 1979 of the border between East and West Germany. Today it calls to mind the wonderfully misnamed demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. And yet the three men manage, somehow, to evade the troops on a motorized rail trolley which trundles along the tracks, away from the border, and into the zone. And I'm going to leave our precy of the film there. Not because I don't want to give you any spoilers, for those of you who haven't seen the film. Spoilers would be impossible, because there really isn't a plot to give away. And there certainly aren't any twists. In short, Stalker works like this. Some men go off in search of something. They don't find it. They come home. The end. Stalker is, in essence, a shaggy dog story. Or a wild goose chase. And yet, it has been labelled recondite, elusive. Zizek accuses Tarkovsky and Stalker of, I quote, religious obscurantism. I want to defend Stalker from this charge, and I want to do that by taking a different approach, examining Tarkovsky's film, as it were, and perhaps naively, at face value. I want to think of Stalker effectively as an absurdist, ludic work, with the structure, as I suggested above, of a joke. Tarkovsky himself conceived Stalker as, I quote, absurd. On December the 29th, 1974, during the planning of Stalker, Tarkovsky made the following diary entry in which he outlines, in very general terms, his aims for the film. He wants Stalker to be totally harmonious in form, unbroken, detailed action, but balanced by a religious action entirely on the plane of ideas, almost transcendental, absurd, absolute. Right from the start, Tarkovsky thought of Stalker as religious action, as praxis, as prayer. It has been suggested that faith is the subject of all Tarkovsky's films. And I want to say this evening that faith, as it is explored in Stalker, is depicted less as a defined and codified belief system, less as a structure, and more as religious action, a function or symptom of fallibility. Faith here is a struggle. It is demanding dangerous and transgressive. Faith and the lack of it 
transforms and shapes the lives of the characters in the film. In this sense, Stalker is a cinematic and dramatic realization of Wittgenstein's assertion in culture and value that, I'm quoting, the words you utter or what you think as you utter them are not what matters so much as the difference they make at various points in your life. How do I know that two people mean the same when each says he believes in God? A theology which insists on the use of certain particular words and phrases and outlaws others does not make anything clearer. In brackets, Karl Barth. It gesticulates, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein continues, it gesticulates with words, as one might say, because it wants to say something and does not know how to express it. Practice gives the words their sense, end quote. Stalker is not about a manifestation of faith, a gesticulation, but is the fallible practice of faith. So what's the relevant difference then between a manifestation and a practice, you might ask? A manifestation, I suggest in cinematic terms, remains, as it were, up on the screen its meaning objectively readable by reference to the niceties and conventions of cinema. Stalker is deliberately transgressive of those niceties and conventions. One might say transfigurative of cinematic convention. Let me explain. It has been said, speciously in my view, that cinema offers uh, itself as a presentation of the world to us without at the same time requiring us to be present to the world. In other words, cinema teases us with a taste of transcendence. It is, according to this view, an exquisite cinema, an exquisite uncoupling of ourselves from the world. So Stanley Cavell, in The World Viewed, asks, how do movies reproduce the world magically? Not by literally presenting us with the world, but by permitting us to view it unseen. And it's on this account that Cavell is able to argue that the ontological conditions of the motion picture reveal it as inherently pornographic. End quote. But in fact, I think, and I think Tarkovsky thinks, cinema, rather than offering us a grasp of an objectified world, a taste of transcendence or uncoupling, works radically to reconnect us with the world, plowing us, harrowing us, implicating us, even converting us. Here's Tarkovsky from Sculpting in Time. The allotted function of art is not, as is often assumed, to put across ideas, to propagate thoughts, to serve as an example. The aim of art is to prepare a person for death, to plough and harrow his soul, rendering it capable of turning to good. So responding to Wittgenstein's emphasis on practice and difference, we might say the film's meaning is readable through the subjective, practical difference that the film effects in us. Its meaning, Stalker's meaning, is the metanoia, the rendering, the ploughing, and the harrowing. When the Stalker prays halfway through the film, let them believe he's not just praying for the writer and the professor, he's praying for us. This implied breaking of the film's two-dimensional plane to include us as elements in a meta-narrative is implicit at several points in the film, not least in the narrative's concern with the crossing or breaching of borders and rules and laws. Tarkovsky seems to be saying that the journey of faith the characters make in Stalker is ultimately a journey of conversion, of transfiguration, 
that is ours too, if we're prepared to encounter what may defy understanding. So whether or not the zone really is the site of a close encounter with something alien, or simply a figment of a warped imagination, the stalker's faith in it is the key to the film. The stalker's faith is the glue that holds this desperate man and the joke plot of the film itself together. The stalker has gambled his marriage and staked his life on the impossible, the unprovable, the absurd. He is the dramatic realization of what Kierkegaard calls the night of faith. And I quote from Fear and Trembling. On this, the night of faith is clear. All that can save him is the absurd. And this he grasps by faith. Kierkegaard's knight of faith is a towering figure, an Abraham, a hero whose faith lifts him above the ethical and normative frameworks of conventional human life. On the other hand, faith for the stalker is not a source of power or strength at all. Faith does not make the journey in the film possible. This is a journey through the impossible. Faith does not make the journey easier. Trial is of this journey's essence. Faith does not reveal the journey's goal. As we find, ultimately, the goal is unattainable. So faith is folly, literally the act of a fool. Stalker is an extended, heartfelt hymn to folly and naivety. While making the promise of its solidly sci-fi genre credentials, meteorites, aliens, a cosmic abyss, and so on, Stalker fails, catastrophically fails, to deliver. Just as Stanislaw Lem was disappointed in Tarkovsky's adaptation of his novel Solaris because of the film's failure to abide by the conventions of the genre in which the novel was written, we might well be disappointed by the lack of science fiction elements in Stalker. When we cross the border with the Stalker and the writer and the professor into the zone, there's nothing remarkable about it at all. There is perhaps a Marie Celeste quality to its pervading air of abandonment, but nothing to suggest a supernatural or alien presence, no sign of cataclysm or wholesale destruction, only neglect. Meteorites, cosmic abyss, a miracle. Is this a joke? What's more, the character's journey through the zone feels like a children's game, a fool's fantasy. There are no special effects, no lights in the sky or alien artifacts lying helpfully around to assure us of the veracity of the stalker's story. As far as the writer and the professor and ourselves are concerned, this could all be a delusion or a hoax, a scam. So is the stalker a confidence trickster? In his analysis of stalker, Robert Byrd suggests, and I'm quoting, it is difficult to rid oneself of the suspicion that the stalker is actually leading the writer, so to speak, up the garden path. The stalker's strictures are improvised, not to protect his visitors from unknown dangers, but solely to stamp his authority on their quest. What Bird fundamentally misses here, of course, is the stalker's own conviction his faith. At no point is the character of the stalker concerned with his own authority, only the authority of the zone in which he so wholeheartedly believes. To lead someone up the garden path is deliberately to mislead, but the stalker doesn't set out to deceive or to stamp his authority on anything. Rather, he risks everything on account of his faith in the power of the room. It follows that Stalker, in Stalker, it follows that faith in Stalker has a vitally epistemological component. Faith is folly, but it is also how we find our way 
through the world. Bird's use of garden imagery calls to mind John Wisdom's famous paper, Gods, which was originally published in the journal uh, of the Proceedings of the Aristotelian Society, but was reprinted in Wisdom's Philosophy and Psychoanalysis. In that paper, Gods, Wisdom asks how we are to evaluate expressions in religious language. In a thought experiment, he describes two men coming across a garden. One of the men suggests the garden is tended by a gardener, while the other believes it to be wild. Both parties are able to claim support for their beliefs by reference to evidence already before them. No new evidence is forthcoming. Wisdom wants to make the point that the arguments of both men are rational and are concerned with stating verifiable facts about the garden. I'm quoting wisdom here. The disputants speak as if they are concerned with a matter of scientific fact or of transsensual, transscientific and metaphysical fact, but still of fact and still a matter about which reasons for and against may be offered. End quote. Neither, in short, neither of these men is leading the other up the garden path. Both men argue in good faith, and both are seeing and experiencing the garden in radically different ways. Tarkovsky's zone is wisdom's garden brought to dramatic life. Tarkovsky's camera remains coolly observant, offering no clues as to how to interpret the stalker's claims in respect of the zone. It reminds me, and this may sound slightly fanciful, of Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. In that early novel of Jane Austen's, the heroine, Catherine Morland, is morbidly obsessed with Gothic fiction, and she cannot help seeing perfectly innocent occurrences and objects in the real world as clues, as evidence of a nefarious and dastardly plot going on all around her. Happenstance becomes significance. For her, a locked trunk or the wind gusting in the chimney, billowing curtains, um, all those sorts of things, they conform to expectations, to a conventional schema which she imaginatively maps onto her experience of the world. But the old manuscript she finds hidden in a locked cabinet turns out to be a laundry list. A mysteriously locked room, when finally entered, turns out to be a perfectly normal and respectable apartment. Catherine's suspicions as to the death of Henry Tilney's mother cause Henry to take her to task. He says, consult your own understanding, your own sense of the probable your own observation of what is passing around you." End quote. Tilney's rational, empirical, enlightened, and let's face it, patronizing advice could perhaps have been wisely taken by those entering the zone. What grounds do the writer and professor have to believe that what they're being told is true? None whatsoever beyond rumor and the reports of the stalker himself, the authority of a man entirely without authority. Catherine's experience of what is going on around her in Northanger Abbey is paradoxical. It's both not hers, in as much as it's not empirically warranted, unverified by cool reason and therefore unreal, and yet it is radically hers in that it is a product of her own subjective imagination. Catherine Morland and the stalker, while they may not be misleading, may well be mistaken. We have no good hermeneutical grounds to trust either of them. In contrast to Catherine or the stalker, the writer and the professor would seem, like Tilney, to be trustworthy. They are both, and Tarkovsky takes time to show us this, they are both worldly, successful men. The stalker, on the other hand, lives hand to mouth. His life is hard, dangerous and poor. He belongs in the margins. 
but he is faithful. And that is the key. Like a slightly more self-aware and mystically minded Catherine Morland, the stalker describes the zone to his two companions in the following way. Our moods, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings can bring about change here, and we are in no condition to comprehend them. That's how the zone is. In fact, at any moment, it is exactly as we devise it in our consciousness. And the stalker's line there concerning reality being exactly as we devise it in our consciousness calls to mind the philosophical theology of Gregory of Nyssa, familiar to some of you, I'm sure, at the Institute of Orthodox Christianity. Gregory of Nyssa devotes a good deal of effort as I'm sure you know, in categorically rejecting the Stoic notion of knowledge as degrees of possession or grasping. For Gregory, all knowledge, like the stalker's knowledge, is conjectural, improvisatory. Gregory coins a special word for this sort of semi-knowledge. He calls it epinoia, knowledge towards the object of thought, Gregory suggests, always remains essentially unknown. Epinoia thus stands between knowledge and ignorance. Hans Urs von Balthasar describes Gregory's concept of epinoia in this way. The logos of creation, the essence of things, always escapes us. God alone knows it. Eunomius, uh, that is Gregory's uh, adversary, his Stoic adversary, um, against whom he writes a great deal. Eunomius, Gregory says, is like a child who would like to grab hold of a ray of the sun. He wants to understand rather than adore. The object, every object, remains essentially unknown and unknowable in the great mystery of the world, its participation in God. For Gregory, all human knowledge, therefore, is true only to the degree it renounces by a perpetual effort its own nature, which is to seize its prey. It's a quote from Gregory. We must hold as suspect, therefore, Henry Tilney's call for understanding, observation, and reasoning, just as we ought to doubt Catherine's imaginative cultural borrowings. Tilney's with sensible epistemological approach, just as much as Catherine's, is fallible and inventive. Epinoia is an inventive approach to the unknown. Those are Gregory's words, an inventive, heuretica in Greek, approach to the unknown. The verb from which heuretica is derived can be translated as to find or to devise Remember the stalker's line about the zone. True knowledge, Gregory seems to be suggesting, is not so much grasping as a straining towards, as a devising. There's a recognition here that our knowledge is always and necessarily incomplete. We are forced to rely instead on faith. Uh, this is from Balthazar's book on uh, Gregory's theology and philosophy, Gregory of Nyssa's theology, uh, called Presence and Thought. It is only the Christian attitude, that is to say faith, that corresponds truly to the spiritual nature of God and to the revelatory character of all creation. Faith is definitively the only knowledge that conforms to our condition. Uh, his Greek, uh, uh, um, Balthazar's translation here is slightly loose. So, monon sumetron estite hemetera katanoese, I would say, is better translated as faith alone is the measure of our understanding, something that is completely other than conviction, which would still only be a form of knowing. So, while creation is revelatory, it can never be fully revealed to us. In terms of how we experience cinema, we could say we may be turned towards the light, but we're still sitting in the dark. 
The notion that reality is as we devise it or invent it, that all knowledge, if it counts as knowledge at all, is at least partly improvisatory and dependent on faith, brings to mind those familiar moments in cartoons when a character steps out from or dashes over the edge of a cliff and keeps running. The character continues to run until their being no longer supported by the ground comes to their consciousness. As though the force of gravity were conditional on our being conscious of it, or that we could counteract it by choosing not to believe in it. Levitation is a crucial motif in all of Tarkovsky's films, uh, particularly in Solaris, as we'll see. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Knowing, noticing, grasping is Peter's downfall. If this ability faithfully to devise reality according to our own will sounds like the power of a superhero. It is certainly not conceived in this way by Tarkovsky or by Jesus. Since, as Gregory argues, it appears we have no direct, unimagined access to reality, we are thrown back on faith. Every step we take, we take on water. In other words, faith is the only interpretative, heuristic strategy available to us. This faith is not a source of strength. Rather, it is a symptom or function of a necessary naivety deriving from our epistemological fallibility. We can walk on water. We can throw mountains into the sea, not because we have superpowers, but because we have no power at all, except our faithful imaginations, which correspond to, or are constitutive of, a radically subjective reality. This powerlessness is illustrated by the stalker in his quoting from the Tao Te Ching. He says halfway through the film, when a man is just born, he is weak and flexible. When he dies, he is hard and insensitive. When a tree is growing, it is tender and pliant, but when it's dry and hard, it dies. Hardness and strength are death's companions. Pliancy and weakness are expressions of the freshness of being. Because of what has hardened, we will never win. And immediately following that passage, that's the end of the quote, the stalker prays for his two companions in words that closely echo St. Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians. He says, for power is made perfect in weakness. The stalker prays, let them be helpless like children, because weakness is a great thing and strength is nothing. The weakness the stalker has in mind here, I suggest, is faith. Faith is our response to the predicament of lived human experience. Without knowledge, without a grounding for our moral judgments, we are left floundering, as in a joke, epistemologically reliant only on our imaginations. Our heuristical attempts to master what Nietzsche calls the perhaps. This is a quote from Beyond Good and Evil. However much value we may ascribe to truth, truthfulness, or altruism, it may be that we need to attribute a higher and more fundamental value to appearance, the will to illusion, to egoism and desire. It could even be possible that the value of those good and honoured things consists precisely in the fact that in an insidious way they are related to those bad, seemingly opposite things, linked, knit together, even identical perhaps. Perhaps. But who is willing to worry about such dangerous perhapses? Tarkovsky is. 
To say all his films are about faith is another way of saying his films are located in an endlessly open perhaps. The zone is a perhaps. And it's only through absurd, foolish faith that his characters are able to make an attempt at traversing the perhaps. We cannot do this by grasping, by an act of our own understanding. Like characters in a joke, we are left faithfully waiting, wanting, collaborating in a fictive game. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, uh, as per our uh, structure, uh, we will now hear uh, a response from Christoph. And uh, if time allows, there will be some questions from the audience. Uh, if not, perhaps we'll, uh, we'll keep them for the next, uh, for the second session. Uh, Christoph, uh, do go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Just a moment. Um, let's see. Okay, can you can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for an extremely uh, beautiful presentation and uh, deep presentation as well. I wish I had more time to prepare my comments, <laughs> so I have to just um, extemporize my, my ideas. Uh, first of all, I think it's extremely interesting because I will actually interpret Tarkovsky from a completely different angle. And uh, maybe the first thing I'd like to say is to a little bit to, to outline these differences. I think you were mainly drawing on Wittgenstein, Kierkegaard, and then even Nietzsche at the end, although you were also referring to Gregory uh, of Nyssa and uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you emphasize very much face, the importance of face, and please correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes you seem to see an opposition between face and knowledge. So face is something that uh, goes beyond any kind of scientific evidence or even maybe even natural theology seems to be excluded to some extent. Um, you also use the, the garden metaphor in the sense that we look at the world and we can interpret it in different ways. So the world itself or nature doesn't answer our question whether there is a God or not. Yeah? So that increases the risk of faith. To some extent, we read something into the world, N not in, a, in, a, in, in the sense of a subjectivism, but that's, in a way, the risk character of faith. That's how I uh, understood your interpretation. And I think it does justice, particularly to Stoker. You know, I find it utterly convincing. So my first question is whether you are happy uh, with, with my interpretation of your talk. That, again, I summarize very briefly. So in a way, you are tend to separate faith from knowledge deliberately in order to emphasize this risk character, the existential dimension of faith. Uh, is, is that correct? Yes, or it is, Christoph. Yes, it is. And I think um, uh, the, the, the quote that springs to mind, uh, and um, I'm afraid I can't give you chapter and verse, but it's in the letter to the Hebrews where faith is defined as that um, in the unseen, in that which we do not know, that which we are waiting for. Um, uh, someone can perhaps uh, chip in with chapter and verse there, but I'm sure it's in the letter to the Hebrews. Um, yes, I would want to draw. I, I, I don't. I don't. I certainly don't think you can identify faith and knowledge. Um, faith, it seems to me, is uh, an entirely different. Uh, it's probably wrong to call it a, an epistemological strategy, but a, but but a, but a, a, a way of relating with the experience of the world as it presents itself to us. Faith is entirely distinct from knowledge. Um, faith, as I think um, the stalker embodies it in, um, in, uh, in the film, there's that wonderful section, if anyone has, I, I hope some of you have seen the film, but the, um, there's, a, there's a passage at the end when they come back from 
the, the zone, um, effectively having failed. Um, and, and the conventions of the film break down completely. So we've been in an, in an almost entirely male um, environment uh, and a, a kind of coolly observant third person camera. Uh, suddenly we find ourselves addressed uh, by through the screen, so the, the address to the camera, um, the stalker's wife talks to us and describes her life and how she has followed him. Uh, and he, he's, he's a broken man and she puts him to bed and he rails at um, the uh, writer and the professor. He says, calling themselves intellectuals, those writers and scientists, they don't believe in anything. They've got the organ with which one believes atrophied for lack of use. They know they were born for a purpose, called upon. Can people like that believe in anything? And I think the distinction Tarkovsky's wanting to draw there is between people, um, and uh, th 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 this, this is the discord, the, the narrative uh, on which I think we, we should all be reflecting as a society, that that there are those who, in whom the organ of belief has atrophied, atrophied through uh, devotion to knowledge, to, um, fa to f failing to distinguish correctly, I think, between faith and knowledge. Faith is an entirely, or belief, it's an entirely different way of looking at the world. Um, so I, a hundred percent, you're right. That is a distinction I want to draw, and which I, I would defend. And I think it's what Tarkovsky is toying with in Stalker. It's a film about believing, and not just believing, um, uh, believing that something is the case. It's faith in something. So this man has devoted himself to, um, to, to the beliefs that he holds. It's a trust as much as anything else. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, just one more comment and then a, a second question before we open up to uh, everyone. Um, in the film, in the film, if one imagined a different ending, um, for instance, one could ask in, in, the, in the present form, how far does the stalker's face transform the, sci the scientist and the writer? You know, one could, it, it's a similar thought, in the sense one could argue that in Tarkovsky's film, in The in Stalker, faith remains a kind of fideism because precisely the scientist is not able to become a more spiritual scientist no. and the writer, even the artist, it may be closer to religion if you like, even the writer is not able to become a more spiritual or, or Christian writer. So in this sense, faith remains something like separate from science and art. And that will be a possible critique of the film. Yeah? yeah you, you understand what I mean? We can, we can argue... I think you're probably right. I'm not sure it constitutes a critique, but I, I don't. I don't think. I, I, I think it's fascinating that Tarkovsky. You know, all the effort that he expends on getting into the zone, um, that long sequence of machine guns and jeeps and searchlights and everything. Very difficult to get into the zone. It seems to be dead easy to get out of it, um, which 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 is fascinating because um, we just cut from the room or on just on the outside of the room. Uh, and the stalker is back home with his wife and monkey, his daughter. Um, the, and, and we never see the writer and the professor. We hardly see the writer and the professor again. I think there is one other scene in the bar, but they don't seem to have changed at all. Um, there is a, a slightly obscure reading of that scene in the bar, which we don't need to go into on, uh, once they're back. Uh, they brought the dog with them, haven't they? Um, but effectively, we just cut and they're back in the bar. Um, so the, the point being, I don't think. I think you're right, whether that constitutes a critique or not, I don't know of the film or my reading of the film, but um, the writer and the professor will have come out of there unchanged. Uh, more to the point, I think, and perhaps uh, more depressing still, is I don't think his wife has changed, or even the stalker is left, um, and I don't want, uh, th there is a spoiler here, but that the final miraculous moment um, is not vouchsafed to anyone but us. Uh, the, the, the moment with Monkey, uh, the daughter, sitting um, at the table, leaning and 
uh, looking down the table, almost a, a, an altar, as it were. Um, that miracle is for us only, uh, which I think is one of the is, is an extraordinary gesture on Tarkovsky's part. But uh, carry on, Christoph. Yeah. Yes, thank you're right. They don't. They come out unchanged. Those two men. They probably come out disappointed and wanting their money back. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. As you know, commentators often disagree about whether they have changed or not. Mm, yeah, and indeed. So yeah, you were saying they have changed at all, but maybe I they have so. so more self-awareness. I mean, it is uh, they have more self-awareness than before. That's maybe not a radical change, but. It, it's maybe the beginning of change, or would you, would you say they haven't changed at all? Yeah. No, 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 I wouldn't say they haven't changed at all. I suppose what I mean is they, 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 they come out not sharing the stalker's faith in the room, yes. uh, but they have been forced to look into themselves. I think what's happened with them is a psychological change rather than actually um, uh, what we might almost think of as a theological change um, or yeah. a conversion experience. Uh, the stalker is clearly on the other side of a conversion experience. The writer and the professor do not experience that. Yes. But I think we do, uh, or should. I think that's the film's aim, actually. Yes. The ploughing and the harrowing, the metanoia. Yes. Yep. And my last question is, do you think, maybe it's, it's too simplistic to, to ask this question, but is there hope at, at the end of the film? And I think, you know, it's obviously, it's no happy ending, that's quite clear. Um, mm. And it's not sheer pessimism. It's probably something in between, yeah? It, it creates this huge tension on the one hand, complete disaster, failure, mm -hmm. as the stalker admits, that's why he's completely destroyed when he returns to his wife, that's no one has face. On the other hand, then the child, so do you agree that in a way it's, it's both at the same time, you know, it's extreme pessimism or realism, but despite this, there is hope. There's always hope somehow at the end of his films. Do you agree with this interpretation? Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, and I, and I, I think, it, um, I, I think it. You, you find it. You find that in in Dostoevsky. You find it in Brothers Karamazov. You find it all over the place. I don't know if it, it's it's probably ridiculous to to suggest that it's a it's kind of part of the Russian sensibility, but. Um, I, I think what you're hitting on something quite important there, Christoph. That the. the uh, and as, as I said, I hope in the paper that faith, faith doesn't make this easier. You know, this is a burden. This is the cross. You know, when you hear follow me, you will be asked to step out of a boat or you will be asked to leave your uh, mother and father or you will be asked to commit your life in some way. This isn't, uh, this isn't an opportunity to um, make life easier for yourself. The, 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 the faith that Tarkovsky is talking about um, doesn't have an answer at the end. I think it's very important, again, going back to people like Gregory of Nyssa and the life of Moses or some of the, um, you know, the homilies on, on Ecclesiastes, where he talks over and over again about um, a journey that doesn't end or climbing a mountain, the top of which you will never reach. There's always another step to go. It's that kind of spirituality that infuses the endings of Tarkovsky's films. You think of the end of Solaris, which you'll talk about in a minute, you know, ending almost on that Rembrandt uh, image of um, the prodigal son returning to his father. Um, th th there is hope, but it's written and conceived and delivered in a register that is also full of... Um, human pain and melancholy. The ending of Stalker is particularly enigmatic, I think, profoundly beautiful. I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of film, um, one of the most beautiful scenes ever committed to film, really, that, that kind of coda sequence with the child uh, at the table. Um, and we're vouchsafed something incredibly private and extremely strange and genuinely supernatural. Um, Tarkovsky has withheld the supernatural all the way through um, Stalker in a way that he, I don't think he does in uh, many of his other films. Um, I'm thinking of, I, I suppose, I'm thinking of Solaris here. The, the, there are aspects of that, the hallucinatory sequences almost have a supernatural quality, but Stalker is rigidly naturalistic um, in the way that it expresses the zone until right at the end when he gives you something that teases and is incredibly powerful and moving I think. Um, 
I hope that answers your question, Christoph. There, yeah. Well, thank you very much. It does indeed. Roswell, maybe it's time now for uh, to take questions. Yes, we, we have some time for uh, one or two questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I'll remind the participants that they can raise their, their little hand. There is a, a button. <laughs> There's a button uh, uh, through which they can raise their hand. They can find it. If you kindly open the participants tab, uh, then you'll see at the bottom uh, a, a sort of there's a reactions thing is a re a re or the reactions yeah you can oh uh, no that's not the same thing yeah, it's it? it's, sorry, it's sorry, at up. the bottom of the participants um right. menu on the uh, right hand side oh okay uh i see uh, uh rowley has uh yeah raised his hand uh, allow me rowley to give you a voice Just a second. Right. So, can you can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah, th th thank you very much for that uh, presentation, which I enjoyed very much. Um, you, you spent a lot of time talking about faith and mm -hmm. the stalker's faith. Um, I've just been reading Sculpting in Time. Mm. Um, Tarkovsky places a lot of emphasis, actually, on the um, the love of the wife he does so, so um I'm, I'm glad that you actually mentioned that extraordinary address mm. to camera uh, uh, towards the end of the film by her mm. but i think in sculpting in time tarkovsky suggests that love is the crucial foundation of everything rather than faith actually i mean obviously the two are closely connected and she has a kind of faith in him mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of her her love for him um, but but that, that you know certainly um, uh, one could um, give the film a slightly different emphasis from the one that you gave. I mean, obviously you wanted to pursue an argument about faith, but mm -hmm. um, that, that that final speech to camera by the wife is incredibly important. It, it thank you, Rally. It is incredibly important, and Tarkovsky himself. It's fascinating, as as you quite rightly point out. Tarkovsky talks about that speech uh, as being. Uh, and I'm trying to find the quote, but he talks about that speech of the wife's as being the final miracle of the film. Yes. Which is an extraordinary thing to say because the very next scene contains what one might think of as being an actual supernatural miracle. Whereas the wife's speech to the camera is an incredibly beautiful everyday miracle. Um, the love she expresses, I just want to read a tiny bit of it if I may. Um, she turns to the camera, lighting a cigarette, and she says, you had already learned, I expect. And she's talking to us. She's talking directly to the camera. So the, 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 he, he's breaking all the conventions of the film. You'd already learned, I expect, that he's God's fool. The whole neighborhood was laughing at him. He was such a pitiful bungler. But he just came up to me and said, come with me. And off I went and I've not regretted it once, not once. That's absolutely profoundly moving. And I, I don't want to, obviously I, 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 can't, I couldn't possibly disagree with Tarkovsky's own interpretation of his own film. Uh, well, I wouldn't dare, but um, that leaves, were we to leave the film on that note right at the end, the film would have had an overall and very, very powerful um, psychological unity, I think. What the stalker, there would have been a very, um, there would have been a very neat reading of the film in as much as these men, uh, the, the stalker and the writer and the professor go out into the world in search of um, uh, the answer to their deepest desires or the fulfillment of their wishes in the room and they risk everything to go out. And what they've done is leave behind um, the, the, the real miracle, which is the love um, that they find at home in their relationships and in the way that they bring up their children or whatever it is. Uh, there would have been something very pleasing in that shape. And yet he doesn't leave the film there. He gives us this tiny one-shot coda in which the child does something impossible. Uh, a child who's never spoken and who's disabled 
um, but sits and does something that none of the rest of us can do as far as I know. No human being I've ever met can do what that child does in that final scene. Um, and that's a miracle. So quite how we interpret, but, but, but Rowley, I mean, I totally accept what you're saying that the, the, the love of the, the unconditional love of the wife for this pitiful bungler um, who risks everything and, uh, risks his marriage and uh, his freedom to to carry on leading people into um, into um, into uh, into the zone. I mean, what he says, Tarkovsky. This is what Tarkovsky says about that scene with the wife. He says the arrival of the star the stalker's wife in the cafe where they're resting confronts the writer and the scientist with a puzzling and to them incomprehensible phenomenon. There before them is a woman who has been through untold miseries because of her husband and has had a sick child by him, but she continues to love him with the same selfless, unthinking devotion as in her youth. Her love and her devotion are the final miracle which can be set against the unbelief, cynicism, moral vacuum poisoning the modern world, of which both the writer and the scientist are victims. It's a fascinating, yeah. I mean, that's Tarkovsky's reading and it's, it, it is profoundly, I think it's one of the most moving sequences and relationships in all of his films. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Thank you.